Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the last uh, panel of our discussions today, uh, celebrating the photo book awards and the photo book review. Uh, I'm, I'm Mathieu from Del Pirenco in Paris. Uh, very happy to welcome uh, Joshua Chong, who's a senior curator at the New York Public Library, and uh, our friends from the Walter Collection, uh, Arthur Walter and Brian Wallace. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Paris Photo, of course, and Aperture Foundation, our partners, and who, uh, besides the very uh, specific uh, situation with the pandemic, uh, we were able to 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 do this exhibition of the photo book uh, um, uh, of the year and the photo catalog of the year and the first photo book. So have a good talk, and I give you the the floor, Sean. Gotcha. Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Mathieu. And um, my thanks also to the fantastic teams at Aperture, uh, Del Pierre, and Perry Photo for facilitating this talk. It's my pleasure to introduce my fellow uh, interlocutors, Arthur Walter and Brian Wallace, both of the Walter Collection. After a successful career in finance, Arthur began collecting photography in earnest. And in 2010, began to share his collection to the public. And Brian, after 15 or 16 years as Deputy Director of Exhibitions and Collections, as well as Chief Curator at the International Center of Photography, joined forces with Archer as Curator of the Walter Collection. So for, so for those of you who, who um, know the Walter Collections program, you know that it's far more than just a collection. One of the things that's been so striking about Archer's endeavor is not just the attention that he has paid early on to underappreciated areas of photography, whether it be Chinese photography, African photography, or more recently, vernacular photography, um, but he's also um, worked to constantly activate the collection and engage it in various critical frameworks. And we'll be talking about that in a little bit. This year, the Walter Collection had two books shortlisted in different categories for the Perry Photo Aperture Book Awards. And just yesterday, one of them, Imaginary Everyday Life, which was co-edited by Brian Wallace, uh, was honored with the distinction of Photography Catalog of the Year. So congratulations to you both for that, for that great honor. Very well deserved. Thank you. Um, we're going to spend the next 40 minutes um, talking about the, the two shortlisted titles. And, but before we do that, I just want to, um, for, you know, for, for the members of the audience who aren't familiar with the Walter Collection, um, Arthur, could you tell us about the collection briefly? And, and since we're in discussion about books, how your publishing program developed? Uh, sure, I, I again want to, as everybody else, uh, very much thank uh, the three institutions, uh, first of all, for putting together in this uh, very difficult times. And then obviously we, we are extremely uh, happy uh, and elevated in having uh, two books uh, this year uh, 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 in the selection. So, um, so let me talk briefly, very briefly about, about the institution. And I, I would like to get away a little bit from the collection or let's talk about the foundation because it's really a non-for-profit foundation. And that foundation operates in, in various segments, operates in various ways. One, it is, it has actual exhibition spaces. It has a campus uh, in Ulm, Germany. Uh, it has a project space in New York and it has a very active worldwide traveling program. So just to give you an idea, in the year 2018, two years ago, uh, we had 10 exhibitions during the course of the year. We had exhibitions in New York, in Mexico, in Holland, in Spain, in Mali, and in Germany. And basically this was done with a team of about four, four people. So the exhibitions we are doing are basically driven out of the collection and they are basically either thematic or monographic exhibitions. Uh, and they are trying to tie 
the areas of concentrations we have, like African, Chinese, Japanese, and now vernacular, and bring it into a broader context in discourse of photography. Um, and so uh, these exhibitions then are being curated by scholars and, and, uh, and curators. And, and, and so for example, Brian is very much involved or is, was leading the effort here with regards to the vernacular. And the effort with regards to African photography was led by Okri and Visor. And in between and to the other areas, there were other uh, 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 scholars, uh, scholars involved. So that's very, very important uh, that there is uh, a research and substance uh, behind what we are doing. And knowledge, obviously, because I'm not uh, an art historian uh, or curator. Uh, the second thing we are, or the third thing we are doing is besides the exhibitions, we have an active program going with them. And this active program is ex either lectures or screenings uh, or symposiums, uh, scholarly symposiums. And later on, we will talk more about the preparations for this book and what we did with regards to vernacular photography. Uh, and the last thing is obviously a very uh, broadly based active um, publication program. So we published over the last 10 years, 12, 12 books on African uh, photography, either on artists or on broader survey exhibitions and several with regards to Asian. I think Great. that Hopefully, hopefully describes yeah. it a little bit. No, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's all incredibly impressive. Um, um, so, so maybe let's turn to um, the, the new monograph on Samuel Faso, uh, which is called Auto Portrait. Um, in this book, readers witness the stunning evolution of Faso's work as he begins to see himself as an artist and gains access to resources and, and more opportunities to expand his vision. Um, Archer, it's it's remarkable that uh, for a artist of Faso's stature that um, this is really the first major survey of his work that to be widely available. I'm I'm curious how and when were you first exposed to Faso's work? Look, uh, that goes far that goes far back. Actually, that was at the beginning when I started to look at uh, African photography. There was in 1996 at the Guggenheim, uh, the exhibition Inside, which Oakley uh, curated. Uh, and it was African photography from 1940 to the present. Uh, and in that exhibition, among Sedu Keita and Malik Sidibe and others, uh, who were, was Fossil. Uh, and that exhibition was really an eye opening with regards to looking uh, at um, at, at the world uh, within where they have been operating. So it was so, so different from what we had known from, you know, Peter Beard or Leni Riefenstahl or whatever this is we are seeing. Uh, so these were really African artists uh, dealing with issues and topics they were confronted and they were trying to investigate. Uh, mm -hmm. And so so, but with regards to uh, with regards to now what was written and done, there was a book in 2004 by Guido Schlinke, um, and that was another reference. I obviously, uh, oh yeah, now here, but then we keep this this image up for a little bit. So this is Samuel, and I will I will go more into it uh, with regards to that. But going back to to Schlinke, he did an exhibition in 2004. On, uh, on Samuel's work. And uh, there was a publication up to that time. Uh, so when I then started to, to uh, you know, collect Samuel, met him um, and uh, had, a, had a dialogue with him. And obviously this book was a collaboration between uh, Jean-Marc Patras, who is his longtime gallerist, uh, between Samuel, obviously, between Oakley, because Oakley was very interested. Oakley was very, very enthusiastic and supportive of Samuel all, all through his, his career. Um, and so we always talked about doing, doing a publication. Can we now take, go on further? 
with the images. Can we, can we have the next slide, please? Great. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, and you all know, I mean, Opry was doing, uh, was doing uh, Venice in 2015, he became ill afterwards. He was very much, uh, very, very involved in Haus der Kunst in Munich. So he was extremely busy. Uh, you know, Samuel was often not available because he was uh, uh, away and Samuel went through difficult times because his house got ransacked, some of his images got lost, etc. in 2014. So it took us, I think this was the longest, one of the longest books we worked on because normally we do books pretty rapidly. Uh, and, uh, and then obviously Oakley got, uh, got uh, got more and more ill. And so here you see, uh, okay, did the interview. And I, I want to make, this book is really uh, a, a homage, a homage to Oakley uh, and, and, to, and to Samuel. It is his retrospective book, but I, I think it's really a homage to Oakley too, uh, because he was deeply involved in his last year. Uh, and this year is, uh, is the last year of his life where uh, he received uh, Samuel and uh, was doing the interview, which is in the book. But let me go to the next image. Uh, so, for example, just to finish this, uh, um, a month before Oakley's death, I visited him in the hospital in Munich and I wanted to show him, I wanted to tell him how far the book is and that we are basically ready. And, and I wanted to show him one or two images. And he said, no, 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 I want to see everything. I want to see every page of the book. And so, I mean, I was sitting there next to his bed and I was going through the thing and he was looking at it and it was so endearing and, and really so, so special. So to me, this book has a lot of, um, you know, connection, a, a, lot, a lot of love actually, I, I, would, I would say. Um, so, Arthur, no, no, I forgot. No, I forgot what you were asking me. No, no. I mean, let's. Uh, if we could just back up a bit. Um. Uh. So, at some point, you have this idea to publish this this major survey of Faso's work, and um, I'm just curious where that idea came from. Was that your idea? Was that yeah, Oakley's idea, idea? Yeah, but the, yeah, yes. For example, we had done we had done a, a publication with Sand to the Black Photo Album, which was crucial, and I think we later on may be talking a little bit about that. Uh, we did a pu publication on Zanile Moholy, Faces and Faces, which was a crucial book for her. We did a book on Guy Tillon, which was a retrospective book. We, are, we were working on a book for Joe Ratcliffe, a retrospective book. So Samuel, you know, obviously Samuel, and Samuel is, is I would say, you know, one of the most represented uh, artists, African artists in the collection. Mm. So, it was always clear we were going to do a book. It was just a question of how to get it together. And, and um, out of curiosity, when you first uh, brought this idea to Samuel, ha had he himself envisaged such a book of his work before you approached him? You know, I think the book which was done before was, was, a, good, was a good publication. It just stopped at a time in his life uh, before really some of his most important works were done. Uh, and then what we did, and, and we did really with this publication, and that was Oakley's connections, and actually mine too. I mean, we had, you know, we had very special contributors, uh, writers for the, for the book. And I just before, you know, I went through it again. I mean, it's amazing. We had five African African uh, contributors. I mean, that is amazing that you can say this today because. In 2010, you couldn't have done that. We have three, we have three women in it. You know, it's, it's, and they are all experts now in their fields and, and, and out there and, and working in, the, in it. So, so let's, 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 let's go through the arc of the book, Arthur, if we, if we could, if you could take us through. Yeah, so why don't we go, can I just go back to the first image we have? We had, okay. Because I just want to spend three minutes on him, because you really need you need some background to really understand the work and, and the magnificence of the work. So here we see Samuel, he's probably 18, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. Uh, Sam, Samuel was born very briefly in West Cameroon. Uh, 
uh, he, he, got, he was as a young child, very ill, was partly paralyzed. The mother took him back to, to Nigeria. The parents went from Nigeria. The mother died in the Nigerian, in the Biafran war when he was very young. An uncle then took him when he was eight years old and went with him to Bangui, uh, which was the capital of the Central African Republic. The uncle was a shoemaker and, and, and Samuel worked as an apprentice in, in the shop. Uh, and in, in, in Bangui, obviously there were several uh, photographic studios and he then became an apprentice cleaning the floors uh, and, and doing uh, errands and so on and watching and so on in one of the studios. And then very young, uh, uh, he says when he was 13 years old, I, I sometimes doubt this, uh, that he then, his uncle rented a studio which was available and he was basically for him and he was basically running it. And he was doing regular work as you can see here in the back. You know, it, it, there was like school portraits of people meeting, uh, ID images and, and so on and so on. And now switch, let's switch forward after, after the Oakley images. Okay, oh, slowly, slowly, yeah. Bert, Bert. So this is this young fellow. This young fellow, think about through what he went through, how he got educated, who he was. And in his teens at night, and now let's just go slowly through them. He did these performances. He did, he, he played, he played all these different identities. He investigated his, uh, you know, sensuality, go, slowly going on, his sexuality, politics, fashion, theater. I mean, it, it was, oh yeah, here the whole music scene, uh, which, which was, was at that point in time very active. Love. I mean, oh yeah, here was a martial arts. So, okay, that's it. Let's stop now with this here. So these, some of these images, and there are many, many images of this. And this is this remarkable body of work which exists. And this was the body of work which was shown the first time in uh, Recontre Africain in Bamako in 1994. That's how, how Sandu became known. Okay, so this is, I think, you know, this is kind of this liberated space, this freedom he took for himself. And then some of the more modest images he sent to his grandmother to show her of how well he is doing. Okay. So, so then there's this change to the, in the book when he, when he starts photographing in color. Yes, so there's a change because here it's always him. It's really always him in his studio and he kind of, you know, plays with his own identity and it's him, it's him. Now let's go, let's go on to the next two. That's, okay, now we are becoming very elaborate uh, in theatrical and obviously this is a setup he, he couldn't have afforded in his space there. And so this was at a department store in Paris. What are we doing time-wise? Because I want to make sure we have enough time. We're, we're doing fine, Arthur. Okay, so we are now at, at, in Paris at Tati, this department store, uh, and he was invited uh, together with uh, Sidhu Keita and Malik Sidibe. In, in Sidhu Keita and Malik Sidibe, we're creating a traditional studio and photographing the visitors. Uh, and he didn't want to compete with them, and he thought he couldn't. And so he created and asked for uh, his own, his own, uh, characters, uh, iconic characters. So this here is the, the chief who sold Africa or his country to the colonists. And the next one, can we get the next one? This here now is the liberated American woman in the 70s. So it's always San, it's always uh, Fossil, Samuel, putting himself into these identities 
and and kind of the the backdrops, the the clothing. I mean, it's this this fantasy. And obviously, then there are many others of these images. I mean, there is the businessman, there is uh, the pirate, there is the musician, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now, so that was a body of work um, which went beyond what much beyond what he had done before. Now we are going to the third one. Okay, so now that's a body of work which is called African Spirits. And when we look at this, this is actually from the exhibition we did in our space in, in Ulm. It's all of them together. You kind of see, can see, you can see 13, 13 figures. You see 13 figures and 14 pictures because Martin Luther King is twice in here. Uh, and when you look at it, you can really divide them up. Some of them are, are kind of these icons, these leaders of African independent. Another group are icons of civil rights movement or racial justice in the United States. Another one is kind of artist. And uh, another one is kind of, uh, what is it called, negritude. I mean, the, these movements with regards to uh, Senghor, for example, is here. So if you look here, what did he do? He always put himself, obviously, into these images. He recreated images, uh, iconic images, which we, know, which we know as icons, which these people use to create their uh, power and, and visibility. Could we go uh, through the, 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 the slide, these next slides as Arthur's talking? Yeah, so that's, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's Samuel, obviously, as yes, Angela Davis. Next one. And this one here is, is Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that's a famous replay. Next one. Martin Luther King, the mug, the mug shot. Next one. Oh, Patrice Lumumba. Next one. Ah, you guys know what this is? No? Nelson Mandela. It's a classic image of Nelson Mandela. Okay, is that it or is there more? I don't know now. Well, um, I, I think is that more? Im is there another image coming? Or is that it? Uh, that, 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 that's it for the. That's it for that's the, it. Uh, okay. this book. But um, but. Okay, so there are many other there are many other bodies of work which I'm not showing here. But you know what I would love to do because I think most of you guys don't have the book. Okay, that is the physical. Here we actually have Angela Davis on the back. That is the physical book, and I think I can show you if I go up. I mean, there there is here. That's the the Black Pope. That's on all so far. That's the Emperor of Africa. Afri that's African spirits. That's Mon Grand Père. That's Mon Ami. That's Tati. And these are the early ones. So there's a. It's a comprehend. It's the most comprehensive, up to date, scholarly written book about uh, about uh, Samuel's Samuel's work. We have in here in this book images of six six six. This is his latest. This is his latest body of work. So, so these, these are, are 666 self-portraits, Polaroid self-portraits, and here it is. It's an so, amazing so, book. So we should just point out for, for those of uh, us who might be confused, uh, the Walter Collection produced not only one fossil monograph, but two mm -hmm. fossil monographs this year. Um, the second one being this 666. And this year is like, it's like a film strip. I don't know whether you can see this. And, uh, and Arthur, Arthur, my understanding, these are these are uh, a series of self-portraits he made with a eight by ten Polaroid camera. Yes, yeah, and he did this over four weeks. I actually was in Paris when he made them. Oh yeah, that's a nice little side story. I was in Paris uh, for a few days when he made them. So I think he made about I don't know, like fifteen a day or twelve a day. And but the most amazing thing to me, not yeah, not this yet. yet. The most amazing thing with six 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 was. You know, I know Samuel personally, and you know, he's a charming guy. He's very sweet. Uh, he is not that aggressive or intense. But when he, you see him behind the camera, he becomes a completely different person. 
I mean, he is, he is like, he, is, he lights up. And so we took a picture of him and me behind the Polaroid. And I look like, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty, you know, easy, but I look like this lamb next to him when he was behind the camera. So, and so I saw there suddenly this, this power uh, of, his, of his face, of his posture, of his being, putting himself into different identities. And that's obviously, un that's qu quite unique. So here you see now, uh, yeah, you see, you see Samuel Gerhardt and me at the library, at the library at Stiles. I mean, you know that, you, uh, Josh, you know that. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a great image. I love uh, uh, Stiles' um, elbow <laughs> on, on Samuel's shoulder. Right. It's a fantastic picture and a fantastic tribute to uh, Archer, to, to your, your vision for putting these books out in the world and sharing uh, Fossa's work more, more widely with us. So, so thank you. Um, why don't we turn now to um, the next title, uh, yeah. Imagining Everyday Life, for which uh, you, Brian, uh, served as co-editor with Tina Camp, Marion Hirsch, and Gil Hochberg. Um, uh, over the past 20 years, I think a lot of us had witnessed this, um, there seems to have been ex an explosion of books on the subject of vernacular uh, photographs. And in this title, you and your colleagues assembled, a, again, a truly breathtaking array of scholars and curators um, and critics to re-envisage a term that has been both uh, useful and, and problematic um, the book represents an amazing amount of collective thought, of, of observation, uh, position staking, and, and importantly, listening. So um, before we turn to you, Brian, Archer, I just got a uh, first question for you, uh, Archer. Um, how did you first become interested in vernacular photography and, and how, what led you to make it one of the focal points of your collecting? Okay, can we go to the next, the next slide? So I started to, uh, you know, started to collect African photography, and and I was I was only interested really in contemporary, not not at the beginning, not really in modern or historical, and there was one contemporary artist, and that was Sandu Mofokeng, and he had done a very interesting uh, body of work. It was a slide presentation. It was a slide presentation, actually. It existed in an edition of five. Uh, the Tate had one, I knew. And when I then saw the, the, the work, uh, I, was, I was fascinated. Uh, and so what, uh, it was called the Black Photo Album, and what uh, what what uh, San, what Santu did, it was he, he was involved in a in a, a longer term study, um, and he started to collect images uh, from his uh, neighbors and friends and uh, uh, in the village and towns where he were where he was, and he kind of investigated who these people were and uh, what their backgrounds was, who the photographer was, what's the, what's the environment was, etc. And these obviously were images which are very different than what we know of late 19th century, beginning 20th century African photography. And so he created basically this, this archive uh, of working middle-class Africans, uh, which was which was very different what I had known. And so I looked deeper, I looked deeper into it. And so he was putting the narratives on it and like, like you know, who were these people? Uh, what were they doing? Uh, where did they come from, etc. So I was then looking at, at images of 19th century. Um, and that was this whole view then of, of the, the colonial view on the African. Uh, and, um, you know, when I started to then get deeper and deeper involved and engaged and collected. Uh, and then we did, uh, uh, and we did an exhibition on that. Uh, and then we did to a symposium with which Deborah Willis was in, involved very much at New York University. 
again, similar to what we are doing here with scholars from all over to bring out this whole issue of the colonial view uh, and to, to look at it from today and discuss it. So that was, and through that, I was deeply involved in historical, in vernacular, uh, and, uh, and that just then developed further. And Brian was, was we, were, we were together doing a seriality uh, and <laughs> typology and taxonomy, uh, an exhibition. And, uh, you know, and I, I discussed it with him and he said, look, I'm interested in that. And I said, look, I would be deeply interested. And so we started to, to look at it and, and pick some selective examples uh, to really get an understanding of what this all is really, because it was very complicated. Uh, and maybe I give it over to Brian now, I talked yeah. enough. Yeah, uh, no, of Brian, how, Brian, how to organize, how to look at it actually, how to organize it and do it differently than the way it was done up to now. You see, that, yeah. was, a critical, that was a critical point. Yeah, I, I mean, Brian, you've been engaged with vernacular photography for, for a while now. Um, I, I'm curious to, uh, if you could just tell us how you and Arthur uh, went about finding material, forming the collection. What, what were your criteria? Well, first I have to apologize a little bit. Due to the pandemic, I'm in upstate New York where it's snowing now, and I have a little bit of an unstable connection here. Uh, but I hope this is coming through. It is. Um, and I can certainly uh, pick up on, on the audio from you guys, and you get a good sense of the enthusiasm, knowledge, and meticulous attention to detail that Arthur brings to all of his projects. He's very much involved. And uh, when we were uh, looking for um, types of objects, we were, we were really looking at the fact that for, uh, for 20 years or so, uh, photo historians and other scholars have uh, wrestled with this question of what is vernacular photography, um, a messy field that includes family snapshots, uh, prison mug shots, anthropological studies, really pretty much everything. And so this project, uh, which comprised uh, both the collection of objects, the exhibition of objects, uh, a large scholarly conference, and the book itself, um, these were all attempts to try to um, wrestle with what we described as the limitations and possibilities of this field of vernacular photography and to to apply to these objects um, historical and sociological methodologies uh, rather than simply aesthetic ones in order to um, develop new meanings and new context for these uh, uh, orphaned images and objects. Um, and the, the exhibitions uh, were organized around a number of themes having to do with, for example, uh, portraiture and class status, self-representation and performance, racial and gender identity and so forth. Uh, and it included a wide range of uh, neglected ordinary photographs that, uh, to my mind, serve specific social functions. And, uh, and in particular, uh, these are often uh, images uh, by, for, and of socially marginalized people recording everyday uh, quotidian events and encounters. So to me, uh, vernacular really means uh, the voice of the people. Um, the types of objects that we collected, as you can see here, uh, were various uh, and not the types of things that you might find in typical art galleries or, or photo galleries. Uh, rather, they came from a wide range of uh, booksellers, antiquarians, flea markets, even eBay. Thanks. Private, private dealers. So, uh, private and, dealers. And the, the criteria, you, you asked about the criteria, the, uh, we were trying to provide uh, provocative images uh, that amplified the themes that we had identified 
uh, for these exhibitions. Um, in particular, uh, family, labor, social rituals, group identity, environments, and so forth. And uh, as Arthur mentioned, we had previously um, done an exhibition on um, serialized forms of uh, photography. And given the fact that much vernacular photography it follows a sort of routinized, serialized production in, for example, studio photography, commercial photography, uh, prison photography, school photography, uh, even personal photography, all of these follow pre-established models. So we were, we were looking for groups of images for series, archives, albums, and so forth um, that would illuminate the kind of structures of thought uh, and the shaping effects of these visual representations, as well as the free play of individual creativity. Brian, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, as you, were, as you and Archer were forming this collection um, and sort of seeing what came back with the nets that you cast, um, did, did, did that experience um, and, and, and putting together the conference um, impact your own thinking about vernacular? Yes, I think I came to see um, vernacular really not as a um, discrete genre or class of photography, but really as a kind of transaction between individuals. Uh, not so much the product of a photographer, but uh, a social transaction between the photographer, the subject, and the viewer, uh, in which all parties uh, had an element to give. And at the same time, uh, we also thought of the objects not so much as historical objects, even though uh, we tried to understand their uh, historical sources, um, but really as contemporary objects that needed to be understood uh, from present day concerns. Um, can, I, can I add something to that? Please. Can I just add something to that, for example? I mean, with sure. regards to the collection, because you asked about the collection, so we see here this bread box, yeah? So just that you get an idea of, <laughs> this, there were a thousand images just in this bread, with this bread box. Or there, there are other, uh, 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 let's call them sub archives with thousands of images in it. Uh, so the, it, it's a humongous body of work. And you know, uh, what we really had to focus on is what what adds, what what brings the point out, or what 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 expands the theme, uh, and 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 really because otherwise it, the problem is you can get lost in in all the material. Uh, Br Brian and, and Arthur, that's a good point, and and I would say that our goal was to. Uh, form a representative collection yeah, rather exactly. than a comprehensive collection yeah. Yeah. to try to suggest some of the ways in which these objects uh, yeah. raise interesting critical questions. Yeah. But Brian or Arthur, do, do either of you have a copy of the physical book that you can hold up for us? There we go. Okay. There's, there's the winner. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, the, the book itself is a, is a really interesting hybrid object. It's both a, it is. a memorialization of an extraordinary exchange of ideas about vernacular photography and, and photography in general. You see what I did wrong, what I did wrong last time, do a book like this, which is <laughs> obviously not a book uh, to study and, and for, for, dis, for distribution. So, yeah. I mean, well, the, other, the other important thing here on this year was really, that it is, you know, it's it's less than fifty dollars. I mean, and it is, it can be widely and easily distributed. No, it feels great in the hand. Um, you could you could you could read it before going to sleep. It's soft cover. It's very accessible. Um, you know, it, but it's, it's not only the yeah. We really wanted to create a book that was accessible yeah. to students and a general audience. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, a lot of the credit uh, goes of course, to Archer, but also to the co-organizers of the conference, 
Tina Camp, Mariana Hirsch, and Gil Hochberg, uh, as well as the sort of all-star team of photo writers and historians who contributed to the conference. That was an amazing and was, collaboration. Right, and the, the, I mean, the, the way with regards to this book, uh, the, the symposium was a, was a remarkable event. And after the symposium, uh, I said to Brian, this is very straightforward. We are taking all the contributions <laughs> We are taking all the contributions, all the discussions, put them together with the images, and the book is there. We will do the book in six months. Obviously, it didn't take six months. It took a year. But that kind of was the approach in everybody. I mean, and that, and, and Brian is right. I want to emphasize that, uh, you know, spend uh, an inordinate amount of time in, in reviewing their talks and marking them and, and giving comments and uh, were involved in the discussions after each segment. Yeah, so, so for those of you who, who don't have the book, who are- But I would also underscore that um, even though our brief was to kind of um, figure out meanings for vernacular photography, um, the sum total of the contributions was really an important uh, commentary on the meaning and status of photography today. Uh, mm -hmm. as we consider its role in our everyday lives, right. uh, past, present, and future. So, Brian and, and Arthur, let's, let's turn to that. Um, the contributors to the book uh, offer a series of important provocations, ranging from Jeffrey Batchin's notion that the term vernacular photographies that he popularized and established 20 years ago, um, that, that it be, you know, he advocated that that term be abandoned, um, to the, your co you and your colleagues uh, open-ended queries about the ethics of collecting vernacular imagery. Um, I just wanted to read a quick excerpt from the, the preface in which you ask a series of these questions. In reassigning or replacing their original cultural function or value, do museums, collectors, and scholars perpetuate and re reproduce the patterns of past cultural pillaging? What, what responsibilities do we have to intervene in this traffic in photographs? And how can we reconnect these orphaned artifacts to the stories, histories, and communities from which they have been divided? And finally, what modes of discussion or display can enable such reconnection? Uh, in light of those questions and in light of uh, the lessons learned from this project, um, Arthur and Brian, there's a question for, for you both. Uh, Arthur, as, as the patron and instigator of this critical exchange, what, what, what were your takeaways from, from the project? Well, look, I think uh, well, what as, we, as... I think what we did with you want to talk about these images, or I think what we did with the book is exactly is exactly to encourage to encourage discussion, and I think and to reflect on it and to share, and to exchange, and come together, like in a place like that, where you have scholars from South Africa, from, I think, Batchen was in, came from New Zealand or whatever, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, from all over the world, with all different kind of views and perspectives. I think this is what you, is the basis, and you want to learn from that and go, and go on. And I think one of the key things Brian has been doing, and I should talk more, is really uh, trying to do, we were trying to do research. Uh, who were the people? What was, what was even getting in touch with some of them? We actually had some of them in the exhibitions we had. Yeah, uh, so, you know, this is very difficult. And, and so do you leave these in, you know, in archives or do you leave them non-discussed or should this be put in new perspectives and reflected on from today? You see, and so all I can say is I'm all for discussion, uh, for availability and for reflection from my perspective. And I, I think Brian has a much more articulate one than I do. Well, as I was saying, we purposely selected a range of contributors, uh, both to get a lively debate 
um, but also to make a specific intervention into contemporary critical issues um, about photography that are occasioned by uh, the Walther collection of vernacular photography specifically, uh, but really to look at the impact of these types of images on individuals, communities, and cultures. Uh, and so the, the quote that you provide, uh, which I believe is from Ariel Azoulay, uh, signifies a very real current debates about photography having to do with uh, the ownership of images, uh, the circulation of photography, and in many cases, the repatriation of objects. Um, so it, it does raise key questions about the ethical responsibilities of collecting, displaying, publishing, and sharing photographs um, by individuals and institutions. And I would, I would point out that in all of uh, the Walther Collection's projects, the real goal has been educational um, to try to uh, teach people about new meanings and new contexts for photography, and when possible to, as Archer says, reconnect with um, the original communities from which they came. Well, um, there's a nice closing shot of a typical vernacular album uh, showing the cover photo in C2. Well, I, I just wanted to uh, just quickly, just if we just go, quickly go through the last two slides, um, congratulate both of you, um, Brian and, and Archer and the whole Walter Collection team, not just for um, being awarded the best photo catalog of the year, um, but for all the books that you've published, these 16 books in the past 10 years, it's an incredibly impressive legacy that you've already left. And I know you have more to go, but um, I, want, I want to thank you both for sharing uh, with us your time, your insight, and these collections, amazing collections with all of us and, and really benefiting uh, us all. So thank you both.